Now, let's get straight into this important topic. There was so much concern during the Trump administration about how the president could abuse his role as commander in chief and perhaps even have darker nuclear ambitions. With one hand, he seemed to seek nuclear de-escalation and peace with North Korea. But with the other hand, he toyed with pressing the nuclear button on Twitter and even threatened indiscriminate bombing of cultural sites in places like Iran. But was this hype, was this worry really justified, Secretary Perry? Does a president really have that much power? Can a president make the decision to launch nuclear weapons on their own? Yes, a president has that authority. He has that capability. And I was worried exactly about the problem you're describing. More generally, the real, the greatest possibility of a nuclear catastrophe happening in our age is not going to deliver its decision by a nation to start a nuclear war, but through some kind of an accident or miscalculation. Uh, this can happen through technical problems or it can happen through a lapse in judgment of either our leader or Russia's leader. So yes, that's a real problem. And I, I would say the greatest danger in our age is that a nuclear catastrophe will happen through an accident or through a miscalculation. And the most obvious miscalculation is one made by our president or Russia's president. If I could just, if I could just expand on, on that. I mean, I think the height of the concern uh, in the Trump administration was in, in just this past January, just a few days after the January 6th riot, when people were really quite concerned that President Trump had become unhinged. Uh, by, by essentially calling for um, an attack on the Capitol building uh, to the point where we had um, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, uh, and this was, this was um, uh, captured in a recent book that, that just came out by Washington Post reporters. Um, Nancy Pelosi called the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Milley, and expressed her extreme concern that President Trump, who she described as, as, as crazy, um, could use nuclear weapons. And she wanted to be reassured that that wouldn't happen. Uh, and General Milley uh, did his best to reassure her with kind of vague uh, reassurances that, oh, we have a process in place and, and nothing untoward will happen. Uh, but in reality, he, he had no such things. Uh, I mean, he was saying that what what he might want to do, but the policy is quite different. Uh, as Secretary Perry said, the, the, the policy is the president gets to decide and a presidential order is a legal order. And, and we may wanna hope that the military wouldn't follow that order. Uh, and and you, know, you could imagine that there was some chance of that when President Trump so clearly showed himself to be unhinged after the January 6th riots. Ultimately, that's a hope. If we don't want the president to have sole authority over nuclear launch, we need to change our policy. That's the only way to give us a real guarantee, a real safeguard that an unhinged president cannot end civilization as we know it. Well, James, I would add to that that yes, the problem is not the problem is not just with President Trump. The problem really exists with any president. And there have been examples in the past where we had a specific concern. Um, the most obvious example being the last few months of the presidency of President Nixon, when he was drinking very heavily. And many of his advisors were very much concerned about his becoming temporarily unhinged when he was really under the influence to, to a considerable extent. So this is not just, and I might also add to that, one of my favorite presidents, President Kennedy, was known to have illnesses which caused him substantial pain and he was taking heavy pain medication for that at times and that pain medication could have been mood altering as well so th there are many examples in history trump just being the most obvious example that's an interesting point about kennedy yes of course he had severe back problems which i think they said went back to his time as a, a war hero during the second world war grabbing his colleagues 
belt between his teeth and swimming five kilometers to a uh, Pacific island for safety. And I suppose if you are incapacitated to that level on such level, high levels of painkillers, you, uh, you probably wouldn't want someone like that solely in charge of nuclear weapons. But let me add to this, because Hillary Clinton, Secretary Clinton, made a, a similar warning um, before President Trump came to power. She said that someone like him shouldn't have the nuclear codes because she argued that it's hard to imagine Donald Trump leading us into a war just because some, it's easy, sorry, it's not hard to imagine Donald Trump leading us into a war just because somebody got under his very thin skin. And we're focusing here on those who we say are perhaps a little unhinged, but can we trust any president with this sole authority? You can trust a Biden or a Clinton as much as you like, but should any president have this unchecked power? The short answer to that question is no, no president should have it. And the other examples, a few of which we've given you, and which presidents who otherwise are perfectly reasonable and straightforward and whom we had a high regard for, still had temporary lapses of sanity. Uh, Tom, what do you want to add to that? Well, just, just to, to make the point that, you know, the scenario that we worry about um, the most, I guess, is, is a false alarm scenario where there's a, there's, a, there's a notification that the United States is under nuclear attack. Uh, and the time frames are very short. So, so any president would have less than 10 minutes to decide what to do in a scenario where there's uh, a warning saying that an attack is coming in. And there's no way for the president to know that attack is real until it lands because of cyber threats, um, uh, mechanical mis malfunctions, bad information, a, a whole host of reasons. And, and the question is, can you imagine any president, any person uh, making a decision uh, on which rests the fate of the world in 10 minutes or less? It's just an inhuman thing that we're asking presidents to do, or we're baking them into superheroes in a sense and asking them to take on this godlike function of deciding the fate of the world. And it's just not fair. It's not a reasonable thing for us to ask. And so in, in our opinion, as you said, no president um, has that ability. Mm -hmm. We should not give any president that extreme uh, responsibility. And, and, and I just wanna add, we don't have to, right? There's no strategic case. There's no national security case that argues for, for putting the president in that dire situation. We don't need to do this. Uh, it's a leftover Cold War uh, thing that we still do because no one's bothered to change it. Um, but we do that at, at our great peril. We need to change this policy and we need to change it now. James, I'd just like to emphasize that this is not a theoretical problem in my view. When I was the Undersecretary of Defense in the late 70s during the Cold War, I was actually awoken by a phone call from the watch office of the North American Air Defense Command and the first thing the general said to me was that his computers were showing 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. You can imagine what a shock that was to me at three o'clock in the morning. He immediately, happily, he immediately added, he had concluded that his computers were in error. And the reason he was calling me, I was in charge of technology at the time at the Pentagon. He was calling me to see if I could help him figure out what had gone wrong with his computers. Uh, the sequel to that story, that we, I could not figure that out over the phone. It took us several days to, deter, to determine there was a technical malfunction. A computer chip had gone wrong in one of the computers and was giving us false information. So it's not a theoretical problem. It has happened three times to my certain knowledge in the United States and at least once in Soviet Union or Russia, maybe more time than one that I know about for sure, which has been written up by a book called The Man Who Saved the World, telling the story of the officer at the, at the, uh, at the Soviet war station at that time, who got a, what seemed to him to be a perfectly valid indication of an attack, but determined on his own and against the judgment of his other junior officers that this was a mistake, it was a computer error, which turned out to be true. He was rewarded for saving the world by being demoted. That was a, because he did not follow orders. He did not follow the orders he was supposed to have followed. Had he followed those orders, of course, we might have not be here talking today. 
That's incredible, isn't it? How just small feats of human restraint and rationality can stop the world from going into nuclear war, can stop Armageddon. I remember going through the, the archives while I was in the Library of Congress and looking at these papers between Kennedy and Secretary McNamara when they were asking about when they would launch nuclear weapons, under what circumstances, under what conditions. And Kennedy, who doesn't seem to have been too jacked up on painkillers at this point, said that even if there was a report of a nuclear explosion in the US, I would send you, McNamara, to go and see what has happened, to go and check and make sure this is actually an offensive attack and not a mistake before I made any decision. And of course, he showed great restraint during the Cubans missile crisis as well. But this is a, uh, <laughs> this is a worrying kind of predicament to be in, especially as we move forward now to a point of handing human control increasingly to computers. And so the point you make, Secretary Perry, is one that is perhaps more pertinent now than ever. If we trust that what other computers are telling us, and if we move towards autonomous control over nuclear weapons or a more computerized process that can be hacked, do we see this danger increasing into the future? Yes, we're not only putting more reliance on machines, on computers, but we're doing that at a time when those computers are more and more subject to malfunction because of human intervention. In other words, we need to worry about the, in the era of cyber, we, have to, we need to worry about somebody deliberately entering our machines and sending them false commands. It's not just a question of the machines making malfunctioning, it's a, it's a question of machines being manip manipulated by some malevolent force. Just to add to that, you know, people seem to make this distinction between uh, our, our nuclear infrastructure, which they assume is not vulnerable to computer hacks, uh, and, you know, the, the, the business commercial community, which everyone assumes is, is getting hacked and is going to continue to get hacked. And the reality is that it's all the same stuff. I mean, we don't have different kinds of computers or different kinds of networks um, when, we, when it comes to our command and control system. It's all the same. So the dangers that you see to uh, computers at home and in the business world, um, those are the same dangers that we have to our nuclear command and control system. And it's, and it's very, very disconcerting to think um, that, that our command and control system is hackable, uh, but it is. And so it's one of the reasons why, why we conclude uh, after looking at all this, that a president in a situation where he, he or she gets an alarm of an incoming attack has to assume that attack is false until proven otherwise because of all of the dangers of false alarms, of hacks, of misinformation. There's too many uh, different inputs that could be leading the president astray. So when a president gets an, gets an alert of, a, of an attack, they have to assume that's a false alarm until proven otherwise. And that means that you should never make a decision quickly. We want to buy the president more time so they don't feel like they have to make a decision quickly. Uh, and in fact, that shouldn't even be an option. We should, we should make it clear that the president has to wait until the attack has been proven to be true or false. It'll be astonishing to so many of our listeners that this is the current state of affairs, <laughs> that sole authority even exists. Secretary Perry, you've been involved in defence policy since the 1960s when you were hired as a technical consultant to the Department of Defence and you rose up to become Secretary of Defence under President Clinton in the 1990s. Can you take us a little through a little of this history? How do we get to this point? How is it from Truman to now that we reach the baffling idea of sole authority? Well, let's start off first of all on how he ever arrived at that, that policy. And I think I was, I'm gonna pass the ball to Tom on this one, who has a very good insight into that, the history of that, the very early issue of that. Uh, Tom, when you tell us how Truman first, how this first happened with President Truman. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to, because it, it actually is a great story. You know, we all know about the first two American bombs uh, that the United States dropped on Japan. And, and we all think about President Truman having sort of perfect insight into all that was going on. In, in fact, he was quite removed from the day-to-day -day military operations. So he approved the use of the bomb. He had, he had some sense of when it was gonna happen, but he didn't really know um, what day it was gonna happen. It depended on the weather. He didn't know how it was gonna be used. He didn't really know the target that well. 
Um, and it, it, there are a number of indications where the second bomb may have come as a real surprise um, to him. So here's President Truman. Uh, two nuclear bombs have just been used uh, under his direction on Japan. And, and the death toll, um, the catastrophic death toll was, was higher uh, than he probably ever imagined it would be. Uh, and then he gets a note from General Leslie Groves, um, who was uh, the head of the Manhattan Project at the time, telling the president that the third bomb uh, will be ready soon. And, and remember, in, this, in these times, they use the bombs as they made them. There were no stockpiles of weapons. Uh, there was a bomb, they used it. They made another bomb, they used it. And, and now there was a third bomb in the making and it would be ready soon. And, and this is when President Truman decided no more. No more of this. Um, that bomb shall not be dropped. That third bomb shall not be dropped until I, the president, say so. Uh, specifically. And, and that was the origin of presidential sole authority. Now, at the time, what Truman was doing is he was saying, this is not a military decision. This is a civilian decision. And I, as president of the United States, am civilian leader, commander in chief of the military. And so I will take that decision for myself. Now, this is quite significant because we've never used that third bomb, right? We're now 76 years later, that third bomb has never been used. Uh, there's only been two nuclear bombs used in history. So that was a very significant moment where the president took that authority to himself. Would, would that third bomb have been used without that? We'll never know, but, but certainly Truman wanted to prevent the use of that third bomb uh, unless he specifically wanted it to be used. And to this day, we have never used that proverbial uh, third bomb. So we, we see as the, the civilian control of nuclear weapons as very important and very beneficial. The part that we quibble with is why the president made himself the only civilian, right, that has that authority and why not share that authority with other civilians, say, in Congress. So what we would like to see is for the president, uh, now President Biden, to share that civilian authority with other civilian leaders. So it isn't just up to one person who, as we've said, um, it, that's an unreasonable expectation to put on any human. We would like the president to share that authority with Congress or a subset of Congress, other civilian leaders that can weigh in uh, and give the president a reality, a check of, of what's going on, whether that uh, those weapons should be used. And again, we understand that that will slow the process down and we say that's a good thing uh, because of all the unknowns about nuclear weapons uh, or nuclear uh, alarms and alerts. We want to slow the process down so that a president takes a determined, deliberative decision to use nuclear weapons, if at all. Was that not Truman's intention in the first place? Because if I remember going back through my history, he wanted to create the idea of, of one world or none. It's kind of one of the reasons why the United Nations was set up. I remember Einstein pushing for this and Stillard, the idea that you had to have nuclear weapons in control of a, a multi-government, a, a international organization that had that sole ability to hold nuclear power so that it didn't proliferate to many other powers. So wasn't his intention originally to have nuclear weapons in or the nuclear weapon, perhaps, in the hands of civilian actors, many of them. And during the early years of nuclear weapons, during the Truman era and the Eisenhower era, there were numerous attempts by the United States to try to internationalize the nuclear bomb, to make this an international decision and international property. For one reason or another, none of those proposals ever succeeded. None of them really got it serious, seriously off the ground. But many people in that area, including President Truman, including President Eisenhower, were thinking about this problem and concerned about this problem. And there was a possibility for several years there that this, the bomb would become international property controlled that way, not the, not the property of one nation without one nation being having this godlike decision as to whether to use it. Um, whether that would have stopped the Soviet Union from building their bomb and having their own bomb is another question. It's not clear that that would. And in, in fact, the main argument against this move of internationalizer, internationalizer was whatever the United States did, the Soviet Union might 
proceed independently to, to have their own law. So it's a long and sad history of what happened over international control of the bomb. But when you look at that history, we were never really very close to achieving that goal. Tom, do you wanna add anything with that? Just, you know, I agree that, that the moment in history where we had the best chance of controlling all this was, was in those very early days um, when President Truman saw the power of the bomb and decided for himself that he wanted international control of the bomb uh, as a way to get out of this arms race dynamic. But it failed, uh, as Secretary Perry said, for many reasons, one of which was the distrust that grew between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, and the secrecy that surrounded the bomb and the bomb's use. Because of course, the United States used the bomb uh, in, in Japan without first telling the Soviet Union about it. And, and so there were many missteps, but, but to me, that's one of the main ones is rather than bringing the Soviet Union uh, into the secret and, and having a pre-discussion, if you will, about the nuclear age before it actually started, um, Truman in the United States uh, dropped the bomb and, and had the Soviets learn about it from, from the newspapers, essentially. And, and I think that set us off on a very bad footing where at that point then the Soviets were just like, well, we have to have this too. And clearly you're not gonna bring us into this, into this club um, and, and so that started the nuclear arms race. There were many times where even if we couldn't have avoided um, the Soviet bomb, we could have kept the arms race at a lower level, right? We could have agreed not to uh, build so many. We could have agreed not to go for the hydrogen bomb, the super. There are so many places where we could have stopped things at a lower level and begun to ratchet it back. Um, but because of distrust uh, at every level and the politics that were raging in both countries, particularly here in the United States of, of who was gonna be tougher on the Cold War, um, uh, those decisions often didn't get made and it, it wasn't until the end of the Cold War when we started ratcheting that back. But of course, by then many decades were lost. I will clarify one point on that, that before the bomb was dropped, Truman did tell Stalin, the United States was building a new and a more powerful bomb without going into details. To which Stalin replied something to expand it. That's fine, I hope you use it against Japan. But it was a, that was about it. There was no real discussion, no real, of course the irony of all this is that when Truman was telling Stalin this, he was already, through espionage, he was already aware that we had the, the bomb and that they were busy building, trying to build one themselves. Right, and so in fact, all that Truman proved is that he wasn't, what Stalin learned from that is that he couldn't trust Truman because Stalin knew that the United States had the nuclear bomb and he knew that Truman could have chosen to tell him about him at that point and, he, and Truman chose not to. Well, Secretary Perry, Tom, I have one final question for you. We live in a world today where tensions are growing with China. Some say we're heading towards a second Cold War and tensions are most definitely holding with Russia. In the UK, the UK is increasing its nuclear arsenal for the first time in a generation. Arguably, we've reached a point where nuclear tensions are more tense than ever. So how do we move away from sole authority? How do we create a more stable nuclear world? I would modify what you said somewhat in saying that we are already, in my judgment, already in a second uh, Cold War, a second nuclear arms race. It's already underway. And so the question is not whether we will start one, but how do we stop the one that's already started? It's a very, very, I think, dangerous situation. Tom, could you add to that? Sure. I mean, I, you know, and, and as we go in, in the book at great lengths to try to describe, um, there's at least three things that we think are tremendously important that should be done. One is we've been discussing is to end sole authority uh, for the uh, initiation of the use of nuclear weapons that the U.S. president has. We believe the Russian president has as well. Uh, and so we see that as very dangerous uh, in terms of, of crisis stability, which is a fancy way of saying that both sides fear that the other might launch a first strike um, out of the blue. And that, that forces both sides to always stay on the brink of hair trigger alert. Uh, and that's just a very dangerous place to be because it increases the risk of accidents. 
So we would want to see presidents in both countries share that um, launch authority with other civilians uh, in Congress, for example. Uh, closely related to that, we, we would like both countries to announce that they would never use their nuclear weapons first, um, because this is, this is again, what, what pushes this, this prompt launch instabilities that both nations are concerned um, that the other might launch um, a surprise attack despite how unlikely that is, right? Because if either country initiates a nuclear attack, the other would be able to respond in devastating fashion. And it would be suicide for both the United States and Russia if either were to launch uh, a nuclear attack. So, so rather than maintain an option that neither country will use, we'd like to see both countries and all countries that have nuclear weapons step back from the nuclear brink uh, and say that they would not use nuclear weapons first. And, and third, the way to make that um, uh, more credible, because ultimately that's just a statement of intent. The way you make that more credible is that you uh, take your weapons off alert and you retire the weapons that would use quickly and first. So in the US case, it's our land-based ballistic missiles, our ICBMs. Those are the weapons that would be used quickly and first because they're vulnerable. So we would like to see the United States uh, and other nations retire, take off alert, and otherwise pull back um, their most destabilizing weapons that create uh, this first use fear in other states. And James, I'd like to add to that, that I lived through the entire Cold War. I was just graduating, getting out of graduate school when the Cold War started in earnest. And I never, I was hugely relieved when the Cold War ended. I never at the time imagined that we'd start a new one. But in my judgment, there's not only the danger that we're, that we're starting on, there's the fact we have started the second Cold War, the second nuclear arms race. And it's urgent that people have an understanding of just how dangerous the first Cold War was to understand why we need not to proceed with this new and equally dangerous second Cold War. If anything, the present Cold War is even more dangerous than the first because of the technical features, in particular, the, the introduction of cyber as, a, as an effective way of manipulating command and control systems of both nations. That's my final word. Tom, another, another final word from you? I think you said it very well. I wouldn't want to add anything else. James, thank you, for, thank you for the discussion today. Thank you both so much for your time. And please tell us where people can read more about this important, urgent topic. I, I start off, of course, with a book, The Button. That's a good way. But there are other books as well. I would uh, also recommend the book Command and Control, which is, a, which is an excellent book on the subject. Tom, any other books you would like to refer to? Um, those are those are two good places to start. I would also recommend uh, various websites, including uh, the Plowshares Fund, plowshares.org, where you can find out uh, more about the book, uh, as well as a video on the book, and also um, about other organizations that we work with. Uh, Plowshares uh, is uh, a funder in the field, so we're funding uh, the best people doing the most effective work. So you can learn about our partners uh, and those partners are domestic in the United States, but also all over the world. Many groups working to reduce nuclear dangers, uh, all worthy of, uh, of attention and, and people looking at their work and websites. Tom, Secretary Perry, thank you so much. And please go out there and buy the book, The Button. Thank, thank you very much.